me tell you about the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees, the moon up above, and a thing called love. Good morning. It is a good morning. We get to talk about sex in church. I am so grateful to be here this morning and, um, and for Pastor Mike inviting me to add and contribute to this conversation. I truly am. He, he did a great job last week introducing us to the, just the simple truth that, you know, sex is God's idea. He created it. And he has a plan for it. And that plan is best understood in a right relationship with him. And if, if you're a guest here today and you're like, what did I get myself into? And you're thinking, this guy seems a little too excited to be talking about sex. Just let me introduce. I'm, my name's Harold, and I, I am the Family Life Ministries pastor, which means I work with families a lot. I work with marriages a lot. And along with being the Family Life Ministries pastor, I'm also a marriage and family therapist, which means I work every week in counseling with families and marriages and church. We need to talk about sex. And I'm grateful that we get to do that here today. I truly am. So 23 years ago, I could have used this message. But see, the church, oftentimes we compartmentalize certain topics that are sensitive, don't we? We say that's reserved for the bedroom or that's reserved. We don't want to talk about that in here. We're working towards replacing that with authentic transparency and loving conversations about topics that are sensitive, yes, but right that we do so. Now, this is a usually comfortable conversation for me. It really is. But it's a little uncomfortable today for a couple of reasons. One, in preparation for this, I had a conversation with my daughter about it. <clears throat> you want to have an uncomfortable conversation, talk to your daughter about sex. And she just flat out said, Dad, I feel kind of awkward, you know, sitting there listening to you talk about sex. That's kind of weird, as any child would say that. But that's not the discomfort. That it's, it's the simple fact that my wife is watching this right now on Facebook Live. Hi, honey. Um, and if I get this wrong, I may never know sex again. So a um, <clears throat> little pressure there. A little pressure there. Guys, today we're going to talk about barriers, obstacles to God's plan and purpose for sex. And while I'm going to talk about three of them, I want you to just know right from the very beginning that they are only three consequences of the obstacle, and that obstacle being sin. Sin. Sin separates us from God, and it separates us from his plan and purpose for sex. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come here today with authentic transparency, knowing that God, you love us, and you most certainly have a plan and purpose for us. So Holy Spirit, come. May my words be your words. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's three barriers, physiological, psychological, spiritual, body, mind, and spirit. That's how we were created. We were made from the mud of the ground, Right? And we were given this thing called free will, a mind that makes up our thoughts and our emotions. And then the most precious gift, God gave us the breath of life. He breathed himself into us, our spirits. And when sin entered into the world, those three aspects of our existence became corrupt. They became corrupt. Let me read to you in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Adam... To Adam, God speaking, he said, Because you listened to your wife and you ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. That, ground, that word ground means all of creation has become corrupt, contrary to God's perfect design. We read in Romans chapter 8, the 22nd verse, it says that, that all creation is groaning as if in the pains of childbirth, waiting for Christ's return. All of creation is suffering as if in the pains of childbirth, 
We live in a broken world. We are broken people. We have issues. So let's talk about them today. Let's talk first about our physiological barrier to godly, to sacred sex. Our bodies are broken. They're broken. And the older I get, I realize how broken they are. I'm not real happy about it. I'm not so keen on this, this aging process. I can't do the things I used to be able to do. Our bodies are broken unto death. And sex is a uniquely physical experience. I was waiting for someone to say, no, duh. <laughs> There's nothing like it. Okay, look at this quote from W.C. Fields. He says it this way. There may be some things better than sex, and there may be some things worse, but there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Sex is unique. And, and, and it's just as if God designed us physically to experience sex in his context in a unique way. Okay, so in a marriage relationship, a monogamous marriage relationship, during the sexual encounter, our bodies secrete a hormone known as oxytocin. Oxytocin. It is a, it's called the love hormone. Because when it, when it is secreted, it, it, it creates bonding amongst the partners. It, it's women, it's research has shown that when women are nursing their infant children, they, they secrete large portions of oxytocin because it helps them bond with their infant children. Men, in a monogamous marriage relationship, during sexual encounters, we, we secrete vasopressin. Vasopressin, it, it instills attachment, commitment. It, it encourages us to protection. But research has also shown that sex outside of a mon monogamous marital relationship, oxytocin is greatly diminished. And vasopressin? It's replaced. It's not even there. It's replaced with testosterone. Men, we, we experience in a, in a hookup relationship, testosterone, which, which drives us towards aggression, independence, not commitment. By God's design, physiologically, we are designed to have sex within the context of marriage, to experience the fullness. It's his plan. Physically, he made us this way. But again, our bodies are broken. And for some, our bodies are broken to the point to where we ourselves, we cannot have sex. If we do, it's very difficult, incredibly painful, and again, sometimes impossible. And so we look at this, and for those persons who experience that, who know what I'm talking about this morning, it's, it's incredible because the message in our culture says if you can't have sex, there's something wrong with you. You're less than equal. You're flawed. You're broken. And I work in counseling with a great many couples. One in particular, they waited till they were married to have sex. And they were young when they got married. And they were so excited on their wedding night to consummate their marriage through the sexual encounter, only to find out it was very painful and very difficult. And not just then, but continuing. And they went to doctors, and they went and they sought counseling, and they did everything they could, but there was no relief to be found. And they thought, what did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? Did God forget me? God did not forget them. Our world is broken. And sometimes we suffer the consequences of our sins, don't we? The hookup relationship, when we volitionally choose to sin against God and have sex outside of marriage, we're saying, I don't want vasopressin. I don't want oxytocin. I want testosterone. As if that was equal to, and it's so not. And then we suffer the consequences that are outside of our control. This couple did not choose this physical shortfall. They didn't choose this. But yet they're suffering from it. But church, God does not make mistakes. In Psalm 139, speaking of us, he created us in our mother's womb. He knit us together. His works are wonderful. We know this full well. 
We are fearfully and wonderfully made. But we live in a broken world. So what do we say to those persons who are suffering the consequences of sin in a, in a broken world that are outside of their volition? We say that God loves you. When we read in Scripture and we, we look at our Lord, when he met someone who was suffering a physical ailment, how did he meet them? He met them with compassion, with love, recognizing, yes, this is a broken world. And it grieved his heart. And oftentimes he brought healing to their brokenness. But not always. Not always. So in those places where seemingly hopeful or helpless circumstances, we find that, yeah, we seek education. We seek to learn. Is there anything that we can do? And then we, we seek accommodation. Is there anything that we can do differently? And sometimes we we seek and find acceptance. We say, okay, God, I believe you have purpose for my pain. I believe you will bring my brokenness into a place of beauty. And maybe I'm meant to, to have this to serve others through. A great many people are, are, are getting together and having this conversation and finding out they're not the only ones. And there's great comfort and support in that. Physiologically, physically, we are broken. Second, psychologically. When you think of sex, what do you think about? How often do you think of sex? Do men think of sex more often than women? Can I tell you, I used to believe that until I started spending my hours in my counseling. It's not true. Men think about sex, women think about sex as much as men do. Sometimes differently, but not, not less. But what are those thoughts? What are we thinking about? Our culture is certainly giving us plenty to think about, aren't they? They have a message for us. We used to call it the agenda. The agenda. Because our culture worships bodies. It glorifi glorifies individual pleasure. And it promotes sex outside of marriage. Let's call it for what it is. They want you to have sex outside of marriage. To the point on our television shows. For every television show that has a sexual relationship taking place on the screen, 24 to 1, 24 times more often they will be an unmarried couple versus for every one that's a married couple. 24 to 1. You think our, our culture is trying to give us a message? Pornography is an $8 billion a year industry. $8 billion. Someone's spending some money to receive the message that culture would have them concerning sex. It's everywhere, the sexual messaging. You can't go into a grocery store. You guys know what I'm talking about. We've, we've talked about it. You go into the grocery line, and you're just wanting to check out. You've got your eggs and your bacon. And, uh, and there on the, right there are the magazines. And there's always that big, you know, cap letters, bold font, best sex ever on the cover of Field and Stream magazine. <clears throat> I mean, what is that? <laughs> what is that? Okay, um, sorry. Uh, my mind just went through a place it shouldn't have. But what is that? The messaging that's going on in our world. The sexual messaging that says... We've got it right. The best sex ever. You would think that with all of the education and all of the you know, years of experience that our culture has had, that our culture would be experiencing the best sex ever. But do you know research is just the opposite? That, that our culture is reporting an ever-decreasing satisfaction with their sexual activity. It is. More and more people are saying they are less satisfied with their sex. But we know how. I mean, our culture is telling us, I mean, it's, what are we doing wrong? Must be me. Everybody else is having a great time, right? No. Sex out of, outside of God's will and God's plan will always be disappointing. Will always come up short. So what do we do? In counseling, I, we talk about the fact that oftentimes 
behaviors are the result of, first, it begins with a thought. And it's biblical. You'll find this in Scripture, that when your thoughts begin, and, and you let them fester for a while, and then you add some emotion to that, right, some passions to those thoughts, the next step is behavior. And so we, we talk first often to men about bouncing your eyes. Bouncing your eyes. Don't let your eyes dwell where you know that it takes you to a place where your thoughts begin fueled by passion or motivating towards a behavior. Well, we talk about bouncing, and when bouncing your eyes, then next we say about bouncing your thoughts. Now this, church, this is um, something that I'll just confess that I have a conversation with my wife about this often. Because it's one thing to abstain. Indeed, but it's another thing to abstain in thought. And so I often, I'll come home and I, I have to confess to my wife, my thoughts weren't so good today. I, I, I was in a place where I didn't want to be and, and I ask her for help. Can I just confess? I ask her for help. Say, sweetie, when it comes to having sexual thoughts, I want them to be about you, not about anyone else. And so I ask her, can, can we have this conversation and talk about those things that you could do that could help me to think of you instead of others? Can we leave the lights on? Because I want to think about you. When I see thoughts, I want you to be my thought. We have to take control of our thoughts, bounce our thoughts, and let them be towards, towards our spouses. And then in preparation for this, this message today, I could not get away from this. If you're a single person in the room today, what does this have for you? Because you certainly have se sexual ideation. You certainly have desires and passions. What about us? What about and having lived as an adult, as a single person for a while, I know how difficult that was. So what thoughts do I bounce to? Bounce to your thoughts about God. This is a radical encouragement for you today. I want you to consider including God in your thoughts about sex, married or single. So as a single person, I'm, we're having thoughts, and it's like, oh, man, I don't want to have that thought. Bounce your thoughts to God. As a person who struggles with same-sex attraction, bounce your thoughts to God. As a person who's, sex, who's struggling with their sexual identity, bounce your thoughts to God. For the person who's wanting to leave here today knowing that they're going to be spending the night with someone that they're not married to, bounce your thoughts to God. And it's like a, it's amazing, church, because it's, it's, if you've ever experienced a fast, a fast is when you deny yourself anything for the purpose of wanting to know God more. When you abstain from, from sex outside of God's plan and will, you experience an intimacy with God. That's amazing. Because God knows your struggle, and he wants to meet you there. And when you bounce your thoughts to him, he will be there. And he'll meet you there. And you will encounter an intimacy and let me define this intimacy. We, Pastor Mike did this last week. Intimacy is a complete transparency and vulnerability with the assurance of trust, or excuse me, the assurance of love and acceptance. When you bounce your thoughts to God, you find love. You find acceptance. But you have to get gut level transparent, vulnerable with God. Physiological psychological barriers because of sin. Lastly, a spiritual barrier. A spiritual barrier to godly sex. As I've said before, sin separates us from God. This was the devil's plan. This was his purpose. We were in perfect unity with God in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, intimacy with God. Vulnerable, transparent, experiencing the intimacy with God. Our devil, the, the enemy, comes into the, the garden and he persuades them to rebel, to choose, to disobey God. And as a result, we're separated from him. 
Now, can I define religion for you just real quick? Because a lot of people, this is confusing, and I want to make sure that I'm communicating effectively this morning. So I want to give you my defi- simple definition for religion. It's an outward expression of an inward priority. Okay? So we're very religious about a lot of things in our lives, aren't we? If I spend three days, four days a week on the golf course every week, I'm very religious about golf. And forgive me, um, but... We know good religion is basically when a person, their outward expression matches their inward conviction. That being said, we also know what bad religion is, don't we? When our outward expressions do not match what we inwardly say we believe. When we say that we love God and that we love others, but yet there's no evidence of that in our life. There's none. And the world knows this. The world looks at bad religion and says, that's why I don't want to have anything to do with Christians. They say they believe something when they really don't. These people are messed up. At least I know what I believe and why I believe it. Bad religion. So the church, in its early formation, came to this question of sex. And here's how they answered it. A little history lesson. Jerome, in 350 A.D., was one of the early church fathers. And he found himself so tempted by lustful thoughts that he tried to channel all of his sexual energy into studying Hebrew. He translated the Hebrew Bible into the Latin Vulgate, the main translation used by the church for thousands of years. But he reported this did very little to change his attitude toward sex. St. Augustine. St. Augustine had, had a mistress and a child out of wetlock before he became a Christian. And once he converted, he was so afraid of the dangers of sex that he said the, that the act of sex for any other purpose than conceiving is a sin. And at one point, the church issued an edict that said that believers, first, no sex on Thursday. Because that's the day our Lord was arrested. And no sex on Friday, because that was the day our Lord's, of our, our Lord's death. None on Saturday to honor the mother of, of Jesus, Mary. And of certainly none on Sundays. And we all know why. Can't have sex and go to church at the same time. It's kind of awkward. <laughs> and then he said no sex on Wednesdays for no particular reason. There's some that believe it was so they could get them to, to midweek mass. Long story short, church, when all of this came to, together, there were 44 days a year that a married couple could have sex. Well, let's hope you're not sick or out of town on business or, or some other inconvenience was in your way 44 years or 44 days a year now the reformation movement in the 16th century tried to write some of this but in england and the america america victorians they brought back this ethic of repression even to the extent of covering the legs of furniture so that they wouldn't arouse any impure thoughts We've entitled this series, or this, this, today's message, hashtag sexy table legs. <laughs> now you laugh, you go to lunch today, you're going to see a table leg and you're going to go, oh. <laughs> you know you will. This is religion. Saying that you, that you love God and you want to serve God, but yet you go so far as to cover, cover your table legs instead of having a conversation and being authentic and genuine with each other and saying, um... Yeah, I struggle with that too. How, what can we do about that? Bad religion. There's a difference between religion and spirituality, however. Spirituality, I define it as this. It's the eternal portion of ourselves relating to an eternal God. The breath of life, our spirits. Now that's different. Remember, sin di- er, didn't enter the world to break and, and separate us from our religion. It came into the world to separate us from our relationship with God. And sexual sin will do that. Sexual sin will do that. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, again, offering our bodies and our our behaviors to God 
It's an act of worship that leads to transformation. It changes us from our brokenness more into the, to the likeness of our Lord and Savior Jesus. It transforms us. We're a new creation. We become like Christ when we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. So what, what now, church? What do we do with this? Our physiological barrier. Let's look for God. Let's look for God. And look for those provisions that he's made. And ask him, well, what about me? What am I supposed to do? Church, can I just say this? Again, the couples that come into my office, one of the major struggles that they're having in, res in, in regards to their sexual encounters as a married couple is, again, they're just not talking to one another. They come in and say that I can help mediate an uncomfortable conversation. Let this become a comfortable conversation in the, in the context of marriage. You don't need to be ashamed of this. God created this. This is beautiful. He intended for, this is God's plan for recreating the world. Think about that. This was God's plan for recreating the world. So when you have a, a sexual encounter with your wife, with your husband, you can think about the children that you've already had, the children you may have, and the fact that you are someone's children. And as a result of sex, you're here. And it was God's plan, and it's beautiful. It's amazing. Recognize it and have a conversation. Talk to your spouse. Certainly, educate yourselves. Continue to read the scriptures and, and hear God's plan and purpose for, for intimacy. And accommodate where necessary. Psychological, this is simple. Include God in your thoughts about sex. That's radical. Really? Like in the bedroom? Yeah. One of the most intimate things my wife and I ever experienced was on our wedding night, was kneeling at the bed and giving thanks to God for his goodness to us and for our marriage. That was intimacy. And can I tell you, that was better than anything else that followed. Intimacy with God. Include God in your thoughts about sex. And then finally, spiritual, let God be God. Recognize that he has a plan and purpose for your life. And, and again, you, we will never fully understand the gift and the blessing of sex outside of a right relationship with him. And so if you're here this morning and you're not sure how, how to, to go about that, please know that we would love to talk to you about that. It begins just like oftentimes it happens in, in a counseling setting. It's basically someone just confessing, I've got issues. That's why I love to do counseling. Because finally people are willing to admit, I've got issues. They're not going to fake it. I can't fake it anymore. If we, church, can just come before God and humbly confess, I've got issues, God, and I can't fix them. Help me. And find through Jesus Christ forgiveness for those issues. Strength and hope in those issues. Include God in your issues. I'll wrap up with this, guys. There's an ancient Roman proverb. I, I tried, I went on the internet, and I heard how it was pronounced in Latin, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and do that, but trust me, I'm going to destroy it. So here we go. I do, I do not speak Latin, but post coitium animal triste. Post coitium animal triste. It says this. Every creature is sad following sexual intercourse. This is a Roman proverb. And when I looked at that, I said, well, that's, that's depressing. Until I remembered who wrote it. This is a Roman culture who were apart from a right relationship with God, who were very much sexually active. Sound like a culture we know? And they were sad because they were experiencing sex as animals without the Spirit of God in them without the understanding of that we were created to be in a monogamous marital relationship, 
They didn't know God's plan for sex, and for them, it made sense that sex, afterwards, everyone is sad. But it need not be true. Because God's plan for sex leads to joy. A joy knowing that, that he loves us, that he was very strategic in the way that he designed and created us, and that our marital relationship is meant to be a, a reflection of our relationship with him. Intimacy, vulnerable, transparent, trust and acceptance and love. So, allow your sexual expression to be a reflection of your intimate relationship with God. So what now? My prayer is, is again, that someone would be willing to go to the next step. To have a conversation with their spouse. To have a conversation with a trusted friend if they need to be. We, we are blessed at Highland in that we have this thing called the healing place where myself and several others, we get to, to hang out with people and help them struggle through some stuff that they know they can't. We are blessed at Highland because we have a group that meets every Friday. These are some of my favorite people. See, they celebrate recovery. Recovery from those issues that they know are keeping them from God's best for them. You have a church, you have a pastoral staff that we would love to talk to you. We'd love to serve you and support you in this thing, in this broken world that we live in. We were never meant to do this alone, church. So what will you do next? My prayer again is that you will take the next step and only you and God knows what that is. But don't leave here without being willing to at least consider and hopefully commit to the next step. Next week, Pastor Mike's going to come and going to close up our, 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 our quick series. And um, it's, it, it's going to be amazing. So I hope that you'll come back. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you that we can be here this morning, that we can worship you, your goodness, your grace, your mercy. We love you, Father. Thanks that we can be in a group of people who are willing, who are willing to have difficult conversations. Because we know sometimes through that discomfort, well, that comes intimacy with you. God, I do pray for those who are, are, are recognizing that, wait a minute, maybe I'm outside of that relationship with God. I pray that their hearts would be turned towards you, that they would confess their need of a Savior, that they would accept Jesus into their life as their Lord and Savior. And then, having done so, begin the journey empowered by your Holy Spirit. Thanks again, Father, for the gift of sex, the intimacy that you desire that reflects the intimacy that you desire with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.